Okay. All right. So, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me for uh, this talk. Uh, first, I, I want to thank the organizers uh, of the conference, uh, Christian and everybody, um, uh, for organizing this uh, really great uh, conference. Um, it's, it's, it's actually really not trivial during these times to uh, successfully set up such an enjoyable and, and, and valuable event. Um, and, and at Quantum Machines, we are very happy, very proud uh, to be a part of this conference and, and, uh, and to support this conference. Um, all right, so today I want to tell you about the quantum orchestration platform, which is the platform that we are developing at Quantum Machines. Um, and I want to tell you why we believe that uh, it's really a new paradigm in quantum control. Um, and also why we believe that it's, it can make an important impact on quantum research and, and the quantum community. And so the best place to, to start from is uh, from asking why. Um, why? Why? So why do uh, we need a new paradigm in quantum control? Why did we start quantum machines? Um, so at quantum machines, we are a bunch of physicists and engineers. Um, we have people on the team who worked on almost any quantum uh, system out there. So quantum dots, envy centers, superconducting qubits, trapped ions, neutral atoms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we've all worked with uh, these quantum systems for many years. And we all know that in order to uh, do something interesting with these systems, uh, run some interesting experiments on them and eventually have them perform some useful tasks for us, uh, we need to orchestrate a very complicated sequence of uh, control and also measurement signals. And these uh, control and measurement signals always are being orchestrated from some classical system. So we always need some classical system that generates and orchestrates all of these, uh, all of the, the entire experiment. Um, and if you go to a typical um, quantum research lab today, um, you will definitely not see a, a classical orchestra like the one shown here. Uh, what you will definitely see is a pile of test equipment. Now, this test equipment was uh, actually good enough for this job of orchestrating quantum experiments up until maybe a few years ago, a decade ago, uh, when experiments were relatively simple. But as the field progresses and as experiments are becoming more complex, this is both in terms of the number of qubits or the number of quantum states involved in the experiment, but also the complexity level uh, of the control sequence, even for a single qubit, for example, uh, for experiments using real-time feedback and control flow. So as the uh, complexity level of these experiments uh, became uh, much larger, um, this test equipment was just simply not good enough anymore uh, for the job. Um, and this really started to become a real bottleneck in the field. So, and really, you know, if science and technology, if, 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 if quantum technology is, is, is at the forefront of science and technology, and it is today, uh, quantum technologies are at the forefront of science and technology, then, you know, we thought to ourselves, why? Why do we, in order to uh, control these quantum devices, why do we uh, keep uh, using this general test equipment, which was not purposely uh, designed for doing this job, and we keep forcing it to our will, uh, spending incredible amount of time and energy uh, to sometimes uh, develop new software and new hardware, uh, programming FPGAs, basically reinventing the wheel in almost every single lab over and over, uh, typically also reaching suboptimal results because this uh, complexity level has reached the point where this is uh, really a job for professional engineers or um, and also, you know, at the end of the day, um, after uh, the, the postdoc or the PhD student that did all this work, you know, finished doing all this work, uh, he's probably somewhere long gone, uh, resting uh, or maybe partying in some other lab. Uh, and there is not even a record uh, to how things should be done in the lab properly. So you have these black box controllers that nobody knows what to do with them. Um, and we thought that this is a big issue, and we thought that this issue is going to actually increase as quantum technologies uh, make it to the industry and as we, we are trying to scale up these quantum uh, devices, uh, um, and we wanted to change that. So that's why we started Quantum Machines, and that's why we developed the quantum orchestration platform. Um, and what this platform is, it's really, it's, it's, it's a fully integrated hardware and software uh, system 
which is highly modular, by the way, and scalable, and that allows you to run uh, even the most complex quantum experiments uh, pretty much out of the box uh, from uh, an, a very intuitive programming language that we call QA. So at the heart of the system, uh, we developed uh, a dedicated hardware. Uh, it's a universal quantum controller. Uh, and at the heart of this controller, we have uh, what we call the pulse processor. This is sort of the heart of the technology here uh, because it's really a true processor. It's, it's really a new type of processor. Uh, and it's a true processor in the sense that it has what's called an instruction set or a language that it can digest. Um, so um, we, the, the, the specific instruction set of this pulse processor, we designed it uh, specifically for quantum control. And it includes and combines together uh, four different elements that, uh, that are essential for every quantum control uh, sequence. So the first element is waveform generation, generating the waveforms that we send to the uh, quantum device. These are the control operations, waveform acquisition. This is the second element. So the measurements that we perform and how we analyze these measurements and, uh, and process them. Then classical processing, general classical processing. Uh, you want to embed classical processing in real time while you are running the sequence, whether it is for looping over uh, sequence parameters or all the way through Bayesian, real-time Bayesian estimations and all the way to quantum error correction. Uh, you want general classical processing that you can program and control. And the last element uh, is control flow. So branching of the, of the sequence, branching of the program, uh, if-else statements, loops, etc. So the language of the processor allows you to combine together and basically create every, any, any uh, combination of these uh, different elements together. Um, and this, of course, needs to be also scaled up by the number of channels or the number of qubits or quantum elements on, on, on the system that you're trying to uh, control. So uh, then we have the analog front end. Let me get my pointer here. Um, Okay, this is just animations that we like. So the, the, the pulses and then the real-time processing uh, that's happening here. Um, and so that's the, 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 the pulse processor. And on top of the pulse processor with this analog front end, which we also designed and developed at Quantum Machines, we also developed and designed a programming language, which we call QA. It's a very intuitive uh, pulse level uh, control programming language which is designed to be at, in the language of physicists. Uh, so it's designed by physicists for physicists. Uh, and the idea is that you describe your experiments in QA in an intuitive manner. And then our compiler compiles the code uh, to the language of the pulse processor to the instruction set that I mentioned. And everything is then run in real time by the pulse processor. So the entire experiment is being orchestrated from the pulse processor and not from the general uh, uh, lab computer um, uh, as typically done. And this allows controlling uh, every uh, quantum uh, device. So we today work with many groups. We work with groups working on quantum dots, uh, neutral atoms, envy centers, of course, superconducting qubits. Uh, my runner zero mode devices, um, uh, trapped ions, and actually many more. So you see, there are really two fundamental things here. One is the, the this uh, language, the, the the universal pulse level control language for describing quantum experiments in an intuitive uh, physicist language. And the second one is building a dedicated hardware, this processor architecture uh, that is capable of executing, running these QA programs uh, much more efficiently uh, than general hardware and general CPUs and arbitrary waveform generators uh, could have done because we're really designing the hardware from the basic uh, building blocks. And so you can see some of the benefits of the, the platform, uh, even in uh, relatively simple uh, experiments uh, already when right away when you start using. So, so this is uh, an example from uh, the group at Lawrence Livermore National Labs, one of our customers uh, who sent us this data. This is the group of, of uh, Jonathan Dubois uh, at Lawrence Livermore. Uh, and this is a typical Ramsey measurement that they perform on their superconducting qubits. And to generate this graph, it typically takes them about 900 minutes with their uh, old uh, AWG-based uh, test, uh, test uh, system. Um, 
And now with the quantum orchestration platform, this drops by orders of magnitude uh, to two minutes, okay? Um, and similarly in other systems, uh, this is results from the group at UNSW, the group of uh, Professor Andrew Durak, uh, working with spin qubits in silicon. Uh, this Rabbi Chevron measurement here, uh, typically used to take them, I think over an hour, if I'm not mistaken, and now it takes them about four minutes. Um, so actually, to give you an intuition why already in this uh, sort of simple calibrations, uh, you, you, you can see this uh, improvement in the runtime of the protocols. I'm sorry, there is some sirens outside. Um, let's wait for a second, or it's, it will be over. Okay. Um, so to give you some intuition for why uh, already in these relatively simple scans, you can get such a... Uh, uh, significant improvement in the runtime of certain experiments. Let's think of how much memory <laughs> it would take to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to store and then play a waveform that looks something like this on, an, on a usual arbitrary waveform generator. Um, well, the arbitrary waveform generator is arbitrary, so you really need to store point by point the entire waveform. Uh, so the memory that you would need is just the duration of the sequence times the sampling rate. So this is just the number of samples in your uh, waveform and times the vertical resolution. So if you, have, if you have a 12 or 14 or 16 bits digital parameter conversion. You can also think about it in terms of uh, information or entropy, you will get the same result. Of course, um, and this is really the maximum amount of information when you think about it that is that is needed that is that that, that you can use to describe this uh, this waveform, uh, because really the this is a, an arbitrary uh, waveform generator. It can store any arbitrary shape, um, so you pay with maximum information. But really, there is actually nothing arbitrary here. Uh, even when you look at this at this waveform right here, uh, we want to speak. The language of quantum. We don't want to actually draw our waveforms point by point. We want to uh, describe them the way I described them to you, right? I can describe this sequence in about 20 words. There is some intermediate frequency and I'm changing the amplitude of this pulse from one uh, pulse to another. And this is typically the case. Uh, so we want to first describe the sequences in an intuitive physicist's language of pulses, frequencies, amplitudes, etc. And then we want the hardware to be capable of receiving this code instead of just receiving all the waveforms point by point, receiving code from which we can generate the waveforms uh, in real time. And the dedicated hardware is doing it again very efficiently. So, in, um, so just to give you some examples of what can be done um, in terms of waveform parameterization in the quantum orchestration platform. So we can change intermediate frequencies, loop over amplitudes or change amplitudes in real time, change phases, stretch pulses in real time, change the interpolation rate. We, we have real time interpolation over the waveforms, uh, multiply IQ waveforms by, uh, by a matrix, which can be calculated again in real time using classical processing, uh, durations, truncations, chirping, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this is just some of the the, the uh, I'd say the elements of the language that that we have in order to describe these uh, these pulse sequences. And so in the this example that I just uh, showed you before, uh, of course we're saving a lot of memory and time because we don't need to store all the waveforms with different delays of the Ramsey sequence here, and we also actually don't need to communicate with the signal generator to change the. The, the detuning, we can change the detuning from the pulse processor. And this takes you actually from 900 minutes here to 15 minutes. The extra, almost another order of magnitude here from 15 minutes to two minutes was actually because uh, they have also started to use active reset. So this already involves also uh, real-time feedback where at the end of the sequence, you measure the qubit. And if it's in the excited state, you send the bypass to, to put it back in the ground state. So. This is instead of waiting for many T1 times or waiting for the qubit to decay, we can use active reset and save extra time. All right, so this was just sort of the high level uh, 
explanation of the platform and some simple examples um, that mainly involve you know scanning parameters and so on uh, and, and and this uh, issue of of, of, of the, the the waveform loading and, and waveform memory uh, but in the rest of the talk I actually want to uh, pick a few uh, uh, examples from some of our customers and our collaborators and really dive uh, deeply into their experiments uh, and show you how uh, uh, they have used the quantum orchestration platform to do really cool experiments, uh, both because this is how we can look at some interesting physics, which I'm sure is much more interesting to most of you uh, than uh, talking about uh, programming FPGAs, uh, and also because uh, this would uh, demonstrate some of the more um, some some of the some some other very interesting capabilities of the system, which has to do with the, the real time classical processing that I mentioned and the feedback capabilities, um, which uh, I believe many people in in this audience uh, really care about. Okay, so uh, the first example I want to talk about is the example of counting photons, microwave photons on the fly with the quantum orchestration platform. So this is the work done uh, at the group of uh, Professor Benjamin Huard at the Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon in France. Um, this is uh, the group right here on the left. Um, and this is the paper that they have published just recently on, the, on this work. And this was the first demonstration of uh, a photon counter for propagating microwave light. So, um, as you know, detecting microwave on a single photon level is, is actually very hard. While you know, in the optical regime, single photon detectors are used uh, every day, um, microwave photons have energy about five orders of magnitude lower. So they're actually very hard to detect. Nevertheless, uh, in the last decade or so, um, several groups have actually shown microwave uh, photons, uh, that, I mean, detecting microwave photons uh, and, and even counting them uh, if they are confined uh, to a microwave cavity, as shown here. Um, and this is typically done using a nearby qubit, the interaction of the photons in the cavity with the nearby qubit. Uh, but in all of these works, the photons had to be stationary. Uh, more recently, several groups have also shown detection of propagating microwave on a single photon level. So, so this is for a, a propagating microwave. So uh, this is really cool, but uh, uh, a complete propagating microwave photon counter that is capable to resolve the number of photons in, in the propagating microwave uh, signal, this was uh, yet to be demonstrated. And this is what uh, was done in Benjamin's group in this work. Okay, so both counting and both propagating microwave light. So uh, the, the device that they were used in this experiment looks like this. Uh, this is um, a, a superconducting uh, uh, circuit device uh, that has five different elements. There is this buffer mode right here. This is a microwave cavity, superconducting microwave cavity, which is coupled to the transmission line here. Uh, this is the orange element here. Then the purple element here, which is a Josephson ring modulator, which we'll talk about. Then uh, a cavity memory, a high Q, um, cavity for storing quantum information for longer times than the rest of the elements on the chip. Then we have the transmon qubit here, a superconducting transmon qubit here in green, and the readout resonator here in gray, which is coupled to the readout line. So the experiment goes like this. Uh, microwave signal arrives through the transmission line and enters into the buffer mode uh, because it's highly coupled to the transmission line. Then there is the catch stage, uh, which is uh, which is which is uh, to move the signal from the buffer to the uh, memory cavity using the JRM, the Josephson ring modulator. So this Josephson ring modulator has a, a, a three-wave mixing term. Um, so when it is pumped at the frequency difference between the buffer and the memory cavity, uh, there is noises frequency conversion, and the signal uh, goes into the memory cavity. And then. The, there is the counting stage uh, where the number of photons in the memory cavity can be measured using uh, a really cool binary decomposition sequence that uses the qubit uh, and the readout resonator. So what's happening here is that uh, this protocol uh, is, is, is a protocol where you measure the number of photons in binary uh, representation. You see it here n. This is the number of photons in the cavity written in binary decomposition. Each Q here is a different bit. And then a sequence of Ramsey measurement here with different delays, T0, T1, et cetera, is used every time to measure a different uh, bit here, a different significant bit. 
But there is a catch here, which is in order for this to work, uh, you have to use real-time feedback in order to adapt the phase of the second pi over two pi of the Ramsey sequence uh, uh, appropriately. So ultra low latency feedback is needed here because uh, this, this entire sequence, all of these Ramsey sequences has to have to be done within the coherence time of the qubit. Uh, Cool. And then the last stage of the sequence here is to reset everything back. Uh, so resetting the, the, the resonators, the signal goes back to the transmission line and then resetting the qubit um, back to its ground state. And this here, they actually also used active reset uh, with ultra low latency feedback, again, to save time and not wait for the qubit to decay to ground state. So this is the device that is used. This is here, this is the, uh, the buffer mode in orange and the, the, cav the, the Josephson ring modulator in the inset here and the blue line is the cavity mode and the transmon, this is the green qubit here and then the, uh, the readout line here in gray. And this is how the device is hooked up in the fridge uh, with all the control lines. And then all of these yellow lines are connected to the OPX. These are, this is both the inputs and outputs uh, of the experiment. So the entire, experiment is being orchestrated from this device, which is the OPX. This is our universal quantum controller that I mentioned. So it really runs the entire experiment and everything is programmed from quiz I mentioned. So the sequence looks like this. Uh, here we see the, uh, the signal that, that goes into the buffer mode, the pump in the catch stage, the pump to the uh, JRM during the catching stage to move the signal to the memory cavity, and then the two Ramsey sequences here. Um, each one is measuring a different significant bit of the number of photons in the cavity. So here they measured the number of photons module four, just two bits for the demonstration. And you see the feedback latency here is 200 nanoseconds for adapting the phase of the uh, second pi over two pi in the, in, in the second Ramsey sequence here. You can also see after that, uh, one could perform Wigner tomography for the cavity. Uh, I have the, uh, the figure here a bit scrambled, but uh, you can perform Wigner tomography using the qubit. The qubit is probing now the, the, the memory cavity to perform Wigner tomography on the memory cavity. And this is really cool because now after this uh, measurement of the number of photons in the cavity, the cavity should have collapsed to a number state and you can see it uh, as a sanity check in the, uh, in the Wigner tomography. So, um, this is that. And after that, there is the reset stage where, again, reset uh, using the pump and the active reset on the qubit, as I mentioned. And of course, this, there are loops here that are both for the preparation as well as for the Vigno tomography, as well as for averaging, for taking statistics. So uh, this is a quite complicated sequence, and this can all be written in QA and again run from the OPX. So I want to give you uh, sort of the feeling of how it looks like. So here are the, uh, the, the most interesting uh, uh, QA codes, the most interesting QA code parts of this experiment, the, the ones uh, involving the feedback. So you can see here, basically, um, this is the part of the feedback uh, for the Ramsey. So we measure the qubit, we measure it actually through the readout resonator here in superconducting qubits. This is how it's done using um, measuring the transmission or reflection of the of, of a signal that's probing the resonator coupled to the readout resonator coupled to the qubit. And then the two quadratures are being calculated in real time, actually using some optimization here with optimal uh, integration weights. And then based on one of the quadratures, we basically decide whether the qubit is in the ground or inside the state. And we decide based on this, whether to play one pulse or the other. So you can see how easy feedback is. You just measure to one of these variables, I1, Q1, and then based on this, you perform an if statement and you can, uh, you can do many, many other things. This is just one of the examples. And then also for the active reset, you see something similar here. This is actually very nice because what is done here is that um, the qubit is being measured and only if the qubit is in the ground state, uh, they continue this, the, the, the sequence. If the qubit is in the excited state, they play a, a pipe pulse to it, and then they measure again. So this is a repetitive success protocol where you keep trying to ground the qubit until you actually succeed, until you measure the qubit in the ground state. Um, so it's not just branching. It's really repeating until success. Um, OK, so this is the QA code, and these are the results. 
um, you can see basically these, these are the probabilities for uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 photons in the cavity um, after the averaging. And you can see that they follow very nicely uh, the, uh, the theory predicted from, uh, for, for the probability of different, uh, of different number of photons for coherent states with different number of uh, photons. And this is for the, uh, for the simulation case, the black line here, uh, where the decay rates are also taken into account. And as I mentioned, you can also look at the at the uh, Wigner tomography, and this really nicely fits the model. Um, so you see, for example, if you measured one photon in the cavity, then the Wigner tomography fits the Wigner tomography of, of the number state. Um, one. All right, cool. So this was uh, the first example I wanted to talk about. The second example I wanted to uh, to, to to tell you about uh, is the the example of the of, of real time adaptive quantum sensing. So this is um, a, a, a really great collaboration between uh, the, the group of uh, Amit Finkler at the Weizmann Institute and the group of Christian Bonato at the Harriet Watt University. Uh, Christian is of course one of the uh, the organizers of this uh, this conference. So again. Thank you, Christian, uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to be here and to be a part of this conference and, and also to be a part of this collaboration because at, at, at Quantum Machines, we, we had the honor to, uh, to actually uh, contribute to this work and we're very happy about it. Um, so, and, and by the way, um, if you wanna know more about this work uh, in Bahia, who is actually performing the experiments today uh, in, in, in the lab, uh, had a very nice poster, uh, which you can watch and uh, I encourage you to watch this uh, on YouTube. Um, so the work is based on uh, the works of, of Christian uh, on optimized quantum sensing with single, uh, with single electron spin or with envy centers using uh, real-time adaptive measurements. Um, so uh, in this work, um, the, uh, the idea is that, uh, again, there is a sequence of Ramsey measurements to estimate the frequency uh, of a qubit or estimate an external field that affects the frequency of a qubit. Uh, and here, um, an extra stage is, is performed where uh, instead of just performing the Ramsey sequences and averaging over them, uh, um, in, uh, uh, using uh, real-time Bayesian estimation, uh, the, uh, the probability uh, for the uh, for the frequency or the field is being updated as more measurements are being uh, are being taken, um, and another important thing here is this that that the, the based on this probability distribution, the phase of the Ramsey sequence is being updated in real time to optimize the the result. So basically, you wanna op you wanna you wanna minimize the uh, the, the variance of the probability uh, of the field or, or the frequency. Uh, by choosing uh, the right uh, phase for the Ramsey sequences. And as you can see, this experiment is, 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 is a very complicated experiment. Um, so that's the first point I wanted to mention here. Uh, you see here that the envy center is being controlled with microwave uh, from this arbitrary waveform generator. And then there is uh, optical setup to measure the envy and, and the measurements are being fed into this microcontroller here, which is doing the Bayesian update and then feeds an FPGA uh, the, uh, for the feedback uh, for the for the uh, for the second Ramsey pulse phase, and so all of these instruments have to be programmed and have to be synchronized and programmed in different uh, different manners. Um, and this is this is a very difficult experiment to perform. Another point here is that actually this microcontroller can take quite a long time to to update the probability. Uh, in this experiment, uh, this was about 100 microsecond. Uh, which here was was not a limiting factor at all, but one could imagine that um, uh, in future experiments uh, this can become a, a limiting factor. And uh, another important thing here is that this uh, this in this experiment uh, single shot measurement is available. So the protocol is based on the fact that a single shot measurement is available. And this subject was actually investigated by another work in Christian's group, uh, Dinani et al. in 2019, uh, that, uh, that, um, that explored this. Um, so typically in uh, room temperature envy center setups, we don't have uh, uh, single shot measurements. So the, the probability distributions for the ground and excited states overlap significantly. And here, another protocol was developed 
um, um, in order to uh, perform the Bayesian update based on uh, a series of Ramsey measurements. Here, capital R Ramsey measurements, where you, you collect clicks in, in all of these R capital R trials, and based on the, on the number of clicks uh, uh, after R measurements, you, you update the, uh, the Bayesian uh, uh, update for the, the distribution. Um, but as you can see, this protocol is not an adaptive protocol, so it's not updating the phase of the Ramsey measurement in real time. And so this was the starting point for uh, this collaboration, and here um, the first thing that was done is to develop a new protocol for updating the, the, the phase of the, of the Ramsey sequence based on the, on the, on the measurements. <laughs> Um, and so I won't go into the into the the protocol, uh, of course, but um, but it is important to say that it is heavier in computation than the one relying on the single shot measurement. So therefore, the computation time may become even more uh, of an issue, and and a microcontroller here uh, might not suffice. And um, moreover, it's much much more simpler to connect the entire set up to a single device here. So this is how the device is hooked up uh, today. Uh, and so you see here the OPX again, the, our controller of the quantum orchestration platform, which is both controlling the laser, uh, as well as modulating the microwave signal, as well as measuring the signals from the uh, single photon detectors. And the entire um, experiment is being written in Qua and run from the pulse processor. So um, I want to, again, I want to hear really like sort of dive into the code. Uh, I, I oversimplified it a bit, but just to give you a feeling of how QA looks like. So uh, here we initialize the vector. This is all in QA. So everything that I'm writing now here is going to be compiled, going to be loaded to the uh, pulse processor and going to be run in real time from uh, the OPX, okay? So, we have this vector of different uh, delays for the different Ramsey uh, measurements. And then we uh, perform a loop over all of these delays over this vector. Then for each, actually for each delay, there we, we, uh, we have a different um, number of Ramsey uh, sequences, Ramsey measurements. This is this M here. And based on the theory, we decide what's the number of uh, the optimal number of measurements. And then we perform M capital M measurements where every time we start a counter at zero, and then we uh, perform our capital R Ramsey measurements, each one with uh, delay T and phase theta, and the result, the counts uh, uh, in U here. And then we just increment the counter by the number of counts that we collected from this specific Ramsey trial. And then after capital R such measurements based on the total counts, we update the, uh, the probability with this Bayesian update function uh, that I'll show you in a second. And then we update the theta based on this new protocol that we discussed, um, and, and, and we repeat this, of course. So each one of these orange uh, functions here is also a piece of QA code that you can write and actually put it in a QA function or a QA macro. So this, for example, the Ramsey sequence looks like this. So we play a power over two pass to the qubit. We wait some time t on the qubit, the delay here, and then z rotation by theta of the qubit. So this is, uh, we have virtual frame rotation. So changing, rotating the, the, the frame of reference, the phase basically of the passes from the OPX and then playing the pi over two part, the second pi over two pass, and then measuring with the laser uh, uh, the qubit and the results go into this uh, variable u. So this is the Ramsey sequence. And the Bayesian update is also a piece of QA code, uh, which is just classical calculation. So it's just going over the vector and updating it based on the result, oh, based on the results. Um, and again, everything here runs uh, in real time on the OPX. And again, if you want to learn more about this uh, work, I highly recommend that you uh, watch Inbar's video here. All right, the last example, and I'm going to be short here because I see I don't have a lot of time left, uh, is um, the uh, the example of uh, real-time neural network. So up until now, I showed you examples where there is feedback based, you know, on some analytical model that that, that is developed. So the OPX can really do this classical processing and response based on this. But in some situations, we either we don't know the analytical model or 
there is an analytical model, but perhaps a neural network is more efficient in some resources. Um, so we here, this is an example where we at, 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 at our lab, we uh, developed a protocol for um, running a neural network on the uh, on, on our pulse processor. Uh, and if you want to know also more about this, uh, then Ilan uh, Mitnikov from our team is going to give a talk later on today um, uh, uh, at uh, 345 GMT. Um, so uh, so I encourage you to, to, to watch Ilan's uh, talk, which is going to give much more information about this. Um, so I'll go over this very quickly, uh, but the idea is that uh, in, 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 in superconducting qubits, again, to measure a qubit, you probe a resonator, you send, uh, a, a, you, you basically probe the resonator, which is coupled to the qubit. So you send a readout tone to the, uh, to, to the resonator and you measure either transmission or reflected here, right, coming back here and demodulated. And based on the, the quadratures, you decide whether the qubit is, is in the ground state or excited state. But today, as people are scaling up uh, quantum computers, more resonators, um, people want to put more resonators on the same feed line to the, to the fridge um, to save lines, of course. So we, we need to start sending these multi-tone uh, readout signals and to analyze them. And this requires more and more resources. So this is how it looks in frequency. And this is the typical sorry, demodulations uh, or typical processing that is done to extract the quadrature. So it's, it's, it's a demodulation of, of the signal. Um, with some uh, optimal integration weights, but this this takes quite uh, quite a lot of resources uh, from the hardware here in the OBX, and so in order to maximize the number of resonators we can uh, we can measure at once with a single uh, piece of hardware, uh, we added some new layers into this. So we have the stage of the demodulation with the uh, optimal with with weights that can be trained. And then, but then we have other layers that uh, receive the results of these uh, measurements and, uh, and, 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 uh, and add more weights and some nonlinear uh, stages uh, in order to eventually discriminate between different states of the, uh, of the qubit. So here, actually, in this example, we wanted to, uh, to demonstrate discrimination between three states. So these are like Q treats, not qubits. So, there are G, E, and F states, and we want, with relatively low amount of resources, to discriminate as many uh, Q tweets as possible uh, from the resonator sitting in the same line. So this is very possible to do in the in the OPX. You can add more layers, um, and you can uh, play around with uh, with neural networks. So in just half a minute that I have left uh, before I I, I I I get some questions. Um, I just want to mention briefly what's next for us now. So now we have this language QA, which is really, again, natural cross-platform uh, pulse level control programming language um, for, for quantum research. It's really, again, it's Python embedded. It's, it's in the language of, of physicists. Uh, it's, it's, it's for all qubits. And now it's becoming open source. And this is really cool because now uh, we can answer another very important need that we feel that exists in the field and which goes beyond a single lab now. And this is to start unifying our descriptions of, of quantum experiments uh, and, 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 and creating a real community. So now that we have this stack and we have QA again, which is close to the hardware and, uh, and, 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 and cost platform, um, and it can run on our hardware, but now that it's becoming open source, it can also run on, on third parties hardware and we have collaborators working on it. And it can also run on our simulators and we're developing quantum simulators so that theorists could also uh, write QA code and run it on quantum simulators and, and you know, um, compare to real experiments. And now that we have this stack, we can build on top of this and we have a project now on GitHub that uh, is soon to be open source as well. Um, for uh, for uh, for higher level components such as uh, characterization, calibration, and optimizations within uh, examples of established experiments, quantum algorithms, black box optimizations again using neural networks uh, at the higher level, the software layer, uh, lab management and automation tools. So this Elon is also going to talk about our uh, our lab management software, which is called Entropy, which is also open source as a part of these libraries. Um, 
uh, he's going to talk about it later on today. Um, and we can uh, really start creating a community of experimentalists, theorists, and developers working on these one libraries. Okay, so with that, let me thank you. Uh, and you can contact us um, anytime. And we're happy to hear from you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So are, are there questions out there? Experimentalists? I can start maybe with one and then let's see if more mm -hmm. people uh, show up. So in the, for example, when you do this neural network thing, uh, are, is it parallelizing the computations on the FPGA? Or, or, or do you need to think it, think about it as a, like a microcontroller that goes sequentially? Over no, it, 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 it's parallel. Well, uh, of course, it has some limitations um, based on our current uh, past process of design, but it's parallelizing uh, the computations. Yes, completely. Okay. And essentially, you built a compiler that does this auto automatically. That's what the, the machine is sort of doing, I guess. The com so the, co the, the yes, the compiler is using the hardware resources um for you and and and, and, and it's trying to parallelize as much as it can based on the resources uh in the fpga so um it, this is exactly this is not just in the neural network every classical processing that you write also for the uh for the bayesian estimation for example when you go over the vector uh and update it like um the the, the compiler is always parallelizing the classical processing whenever it can um to happen while pulses are being played while other classical processing is happening of course with the limitation of however many parallel resources uh that uh, we put there there's a question by travis travis do um can you guys maybe unmute him and so they can he can ask him himself maybe i think it's more uh... Well, thank you. Uh, so hi, Jonathan. That was a, a very lovely talk and, and everything like that. And, and I know we, we've had a chance to talk in the past about Qua and, and yeah. stuff like that, I guess. So I'm, I'm kind of maybe curious still, in retrospect, what were some of the main challenges in turning Qua into something which was compatible with other open source specifications, such as the one that, that we put out from IBM Quantum about the, the open pulse specification? Uh, I, I mean, actually, I mean, so that's that's a good question. But actually, I mean, it was quite uh, quite nice the integration with OpenSpulse. Um, I must say that we we haven't had that many challenges because uh, this you know was sort of a natural uh, natural connection there. So uh, um, we haven't we haven't had too much uh, trouble. Uh, Qua is very okay. much compatible with with, uh, with OpenSpulse, and we have. Open Pulse integration uh, running, you know, in our lab, uh, which allows us also to use higher uh, some of the higher levels in Qiskit, for example, uh, to do interesting sure. things today. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, again, I, I think it's it's very exciting the direction that you're taking Qua and, and open sourcing it and, and stuff like that. And I certainly look forward to more stuff from Quantum Machines uh, about that. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, Timo, please. I'm also just unmuting myself. Um, so I was wondering um, how complicated the analysis and the feedback loop can actually become because you have, of course, restricted resources on the FPGA. So in particular, could I just um, take an analog input trace and run arbitrary floating point operations for my adaptive update step? So um, floating point is something that we are going to support um, in several months. So right now there is only fixed point calculations, uh, but we are putting a floating point in, um, which is really cool uh, because I think it's going to make, uh, mainly make the life of the users uh, much simpler. Um, and and the, the only limitation there is that uh, the signal, so the signal has been sampled. So, okay, so this is really like specific to the, the, our first product, which is the OPX that you saw, that the sampling rate is one giga sample per second, uh, but the uh, but you can perform, you can create this, this you, you basically can, you have to bunch together. If you want to perform arbitrary uh, computation on the, on the signal that you acquire in the ADC, you need to bunch together every four samples. So you can do it with a resolution of, of 250 megahertz. Uh, other than that, you could do completely arbitrary calculations on the signal. Um, 
Mm -hmm. Anybody Does this else answer the question, by the way? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I, I would need to look into what, what your hardware is really capable of doing, but you know, I, I see you offer um, kits to, to test out, right, on your website. Um, yeah, the demodulation is happening with one nanosecond resolution, by the way. So we, we process the signal, but you can perform basically a demodulation and integration actually without doing any demodulation and with integrating just four samples. And then you just get in pieces the signal at uh, you know, four nanosecond resolution. So there is another question by Josh. I don't know if that was that answered. I don't think so. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. or was it for is it something I can see on the... Oh, it's from before. No, sorry. Yeah, I apologize. Oh, okay. okay. Any other questions? I think there's maybe space for one more if there is any. In any case, as for all the other talks, feel free to post questions on Slack, or you can email Jonathan directly at the address you see here. Okay, doesn't look like. So thanks, Jonathan, again for the nice talk. Thanks Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank Christian. <laughs> Thank everybody for listening to this section. And then remember, so the next one starts in 30 minutes, so you just have time for a little break. And remember that at the end of that session, there is the photo, so again, be there. See you later. Bye-bye.